All right, so picture this. You're taking a hot shower one day and all of a sudden your skooma addicted friend calls you. Let's call him, I don't know. What's a really stupid name befitting a perilous heathen? Um, uh, Zeddy. So Zeddy, who's a terrible influence by the way, calls you and says, Crap, Defcon Zero, traffic light protocol. What the f***? Defcon Zero, traffic light protocol red. I used your NTAPI video to test my organization and it immediately got caught. Now we're under cyber lockdown. Uh, okay, so obviously one, your parietal bone imploded or something. You must have missed the 30 quadrillion disclaimers I put in my videos or descriptions or whatever. And two, listen, this is just a borked engagement. It happens sometimes, you know? Just let them know. Oh, about that, you see, they don't actually know that someone would be testing, and we didn't really have an official engagement planned. Okay, so right, alright Zeddy, basically what you've done here is the whole threat emulation thing without the emulation part. Huh? You f***ing convict. You f***ing bandit. What? No! I said earlier that there's so much more to malware development and it only starts getting deeper and more interesting after we pass the realm of WinAPI. That isn't to say that WinAPI in itself is boring, there's a lot of stuff you can do still, but we start getting really advanced when we leave that road behind. You know, maybe it's my own fault for uploading once a decade, oh well. I guess today's the day where we learn to peel back another layer on the moldy onion that is malware development and really make something that's pretty cool and for the most part actually pretty capable. Now, expanding on that last claim, these techniques aren't zero days or some stupid shit like that. These techniques have been around for a while and you won't find some sort of clandestine quote fully undetectable end quote techniques here, especially not from a headass like me. There's also a claim to be made that the idea of FUD in itself is somewhat paradoxical. But hey, this is hacking time, not Dr. Phil philosophy time. Thank you, I, I won't be here all night. There's just so much to consider when developing your malware. Too many things to list here. Attempting to do so would be like holding a grain of sand to the stars, showing just how much actually goes into all of this and how many compositions of techniques, researching, experimentation, and more is required. However, these techniques are, for the most part, techniques that we can employ that will bring us up from that beginner skill level all the way up to the lower intermediate-ish level of malware development. You know, maybe even really close to advanced. So congratulations, you're officially not a beginner anymore. Ah, crow, there's too much. Where the hell do I even begin, man? There's too many techniques. I, I need a structured approach to learn all of this. Hey man, I get you. And I come bearing gifts as well. What, what gifts? Well, 10% off the sponsor of today's video, of course, Maldev Academy. What better way to learn the ins and outs of malware than a platform made solely for that purpose and made with an efficient and structured learning method in mind where you can go from Zeddy, Ugh, to mob boss. You really can't go wrong here. There are constant updates always happening, so much content already on the site as well as so much more planned. You remove the hassle of setting up a development machine because these gods have so graciously gifted us one to begin developing code right away with no extra setup required. You're given modules with extra objectives so that after you finish a module, you can apply what you've learned practically or solidify your learning. You can also download the code of the modules and see if you were on the right track or expand upon what you've learned. And if you need more of a challenge than the challenge Challenges tab is your best friend, providing you with real practical scenarios that you can implement in your code or help crystallize your skills. One of the biggest draws about this entire platform is the Discord server, where you can find gods of exploitation and beginners all in one place, constantly helping each other out, having a laugh, and requesting features with the incredible founders so eager to implement them. You wish there was something on the site in terms of content or features or health, even in the server? Well, request away. That's how certain modules even came to be. It's a very community-driven project, and the community itself is very tightly knit. I, I love you guys. We love you too, crew. Oh yes, especially me. I love you the most. <laughs> Thanks, Havoc Author Spider. So please find the pinned comment below or the first link in the description to get 10% off your order and start developing the malware you want to, and you deserve to, today. Let's get back to the video. And so in this video, we're going to cover what happens in the elusive kernel land, we'll implement an injector that uses direct syscalls, and finally make an injector that uses indirect syscalls. 
15 c mandatory disclaimer for the two lead to care thugs watching this video like that blasted zeddy character let me remind you that doing any of what you may see here against anything you do not own is illegal like crazy illegal i'm not going to be held responsible if one day your prefrontal cortex misses a quick time event and you end up attacking someone or something without their explicit written permission that's on you we're doing this strictly to understand how certain samples of malware employ these techniques so it's solely for educational purposes with that out of the way let's do a little recap Starting off in user land, we know that most of our functions that we've been using up to this point come from a library called kernel32.dll. Functions we've been using like open process, virtual alloc, create remote thread x, sequester your soul, whatever it is, we call those functions from our programs. When we issue out that call within our program, what happens next is the following. The call gets forwarded down to an intermediary module called kernelbase.dll, which we already know sort of just acts like a proxy. After a stupid little function goes on with its belligerent ass journey inside of kernel base, it eventually finds itself jumping into NTDLL. If you will recall, this is a library where the native API functions are exported from. And the native API is the unabstracted, unwrapped goodness on which the Win API sits. Inside of NTDLL, the function moves in its dedicated syscall number or system service number into the EAX register. It then does a quick check to see if the legacy instruction is going to be used or the newer and hotter syscall instruction is to be used, which we already know is decided by what value is inside of the system call member in the K user shared data kernel structure. Finally, it's entered into the threshold of the kernel by using the syscall instruction where it's then actually ran. At a little side note about step three, we know that this instruction gets chosen over the syscall instruction if we're on 32-bit systems, but we also have to remember that there exists a sysenter and sysexit pair. You know, they're preferred, but that's more on that later. So yeah, we know that it only happens if we're on 32-bit systems, which is why we sometimes refer to it as a legacy instruction. But that's only part of the picture. The Hex2E interrupt can actually be set on your machine for a couple of different reasons. The most obvious or predominant reason for its invocation being that, yeah, your machine is on the 32-bit architecture. Another way this can be set, though, is if you have Credential Guard enabled. We'll talk about Credential Guard in another video. It's too beefy a subject to cover at a passing glance. Credential Guard utilizes the hypervisor, so it's virtualized, which can actually handle the legacy Hex2E interrupt instruction a lot easier than it can a syscall instruction, even though the syscall instruction is much faster, like three times faster if I remember correctly. The legacy instruction for the hypervisor is just easier to process, so that's just something to keep in the back pocket of your maldev trousers, which you should really, really wash, by the way. Now, I'm not sure if you've ever tried reading about syscalls or kernel internals for hours or days on end from various obscure resources, but severe insanity would probably be the best possible outcome. Honestly, it kind of explains why some of you are the way that you are. Uh, but now I've become one of you, haven't I? But worry not. I'm nothing if not a vessel who depletes his own sanity for the masses, thus I'll try my best to explain my findings. The first thing that happens after syscall instruction is issued is that the address directly after the syscall instruction, in this case, the return instruction, is placed into the RCX register. This is done so that once we're in kernel mode, we can return back to userland and continue our execution in the user space. And we can also see this in real time with the debugger, and we can see that this is also the expected behavior from the 5,000 page behemoth that is the Intel manual. So we're looking good here. After this, a really cool sounding register called the long system target address register, or the IA32 L star places a value that it holds into the instruction pointer RIP. Now, aside from sounding like something the fucking Avengers would have to fight, it belongs to a group of certain registers which are called the model specific registers or MSR. And there's a lot of them. Like, hey, let's just turn this into its own volume. Kind of a lot. From the sections, we see that there's two sort of subsections. We have the architectural MSRs, and then from that downwards, we have the actual specific MSRs for each model. You can think of the first section as the common MSRs that you might find amongst all models, or most models, and then the other sections being, you know, specific to a model. So these MSRs, they're used for a lot of different things. 
They were first introduced by Intel on the Pentium processor, and because Intel added in these new kinds of registers, they needed a way in order to perform operations on these registers, such as reading or writing. And so at the very least, they had to add in two new instructions for these MSRs, which would let us read and write to them. And they're called the read MSR instruction and the write MSR instruction, respectively. But you might be tempted to go out and run these instructions right away and right now to see what you can get or set, but you can't, at least not yet. These two instructions belong to a group of instructions called the system instructions or privileged instructions. And so you actually can't even run these unless you have ring zero permissions. In other words, you can only execute these instructions if you're in the kernel. If you do try to execute these instructions from user land or when you don't have the necessary permissions, a general protection exception is going to be generated. Basically, Intel's way of saying, ah! So now, getting a really small idea of what these MSRs are and what they're kind of used for, we can go back to the L-Star MSR. You know that butter robot from Rick and Morty who was like, oh, what's my purpose? Yeah, the L-Star's entire purpose on this planet is just existing so that it can place the value that it holds into the RIP register once a syscall has been invoked. Oh my god. Now, if you take a second to take this in, that means that this MSR holds within it the first address or function that we'll ever run as soon as we step inside of the kernel space. And even better, we can see this address. Well, not from userland, but we can see it. So let's head over to a kernel debugger and actually read the value that's inside of here to see what our first steps in the kernel is going to be. Now before reading this though, we need to find out the address of the IA32L star. These MSRs have specific addresses in which you access them. The Intel manual, which I think I've started to love even more than the MSDN at this point, actually a lot more, tells us that this register specific address is this. That's how we read or write to it. This is the address of that register. Now pop quiz, we're attempting to read the value from IA32L star, which is an MSR. Which instruction do we use to do this and from where? I know it seems like a very random address and I know I said you should visit my blog for the nitty gritty details but I can't help myself. Where the f*** does this address come from? Why this specific address? Okay, so it, along with a couple of other MSRs, get initialized to specific addresses during boot time by the kernel. The KI system startup is the entry point routine of our kernel. It's responsible for some basic initialization, and to do that, it in turn calls the KI initialize boot structures routine, which is responsible for setting our MSRs. If we disassemble this routine, either through assembly or just see some code for it, we can see that at these exact lines where our MSRs get their funky addresses, which will remain constant for us to read until we decide that we hate computers and chuck ours against the wall. Just so it's less of a mystery, seeing like all these instructions, the way that the write MSR instruction itself works is it takes what's in the EAX and EDX register and writes that into the MSR register that we specify with ECX. All right, so we have this address. What is it? Doing some quick little magic, we can see that this is the KI system 64 routine. Ah, so this is the first thing we run after we invoke a syscall. Yeah, this is the first thing. What this function does, it's really cool. We won't go super in depth into it, but I'll talk about about what it does. Now, before continuing, we must look at the, the syscall number itself. Have you ever wondered what its deal is? I mean, we know it's sort of like an NTAPI's ID card, right? But we must ask ourselves the age-old question. Is there more to this seemingly uncomplex hex piece of text? Boo! Yeah, there's actually a lot more. It keeps with it the index value, which is the value we're going to be using to index the array of kernel routines, which we'll get to. But that's very important because without it, the kernel won't know what the hell to run. But there's also this thing called a table identifier, which will fall into one of two categories, either a GUI function or a regular routine function. Now, please do me a favor and just read this incredible blog that can better outline the entire process way better than I could. It's been my saving grace multiple times on my journey understanding this process, and even now, I still come back to it from time to time, and I am completely in awe. This is so well written, and every time you read it, you get something new from it, so please check it out. It's still one of my favorite pieces to read from time to time, as well as these. I'll have all of these linked in the description should you wish to read more, which you're heavily encouraged to do so. So eventually our KI system call function will end up calling the KI system service start routine in which a couple of things are taken from our SSN that we've stored in EAX back in user land. This routine retrieves a table identifier to determine if it's going to be a GUI function or a regular old native function. And it also extracts the system call index from our SSN as well. All this is done so that we could provide this extracted system call index and use it as an actual index to the long long array of kernel routines so that we run what we're actually intending to run. Now this is done in the KI system service repeat routine, 
and the routine itself starts off by loading in the address, which is what the LEA or load effective address instruction does, to the R10 and R11 registers. The KE service descriptor table is a kernel structure that's comprised of four system service table or SST structures. These SSTs that make up the service descriptor table looks like this. And since we know that this is an array of a bunch of kernel routines that the NTAPI is eventually going to execute in kernel land, we can start looking into this to see these routines and how they're laid out. Starting off with the first routine we can find, we know that in standard C programming the first element of an array is the same as the address of an array because, well that's where the array starts from, it's first element. Now dumping the first result we get the following, which is the first routine that we'll see here. And if we dump some more that we'll see that these are separated in 4 byte offsets. So every 4 bytes we get a new routine. So this is the index that we access and if we do some magic we can actually find out what function this is. For 64 bit we have to do a little bit more work than in 32 bit because in 64 bit we have some relative addressing involved, but it's not too bad. If we take a random syscall number, for example, and add that to the address of the array times 4 because of the 4 by offset, we'll find our function, or we'll find the, the routine that our function is going to call, and then we can dump that to see that it matches up, and it's really cool. Now, once all of this is done, the syswrite instruction swoops in to unfuck up everything that the syscall has fucked up, and from the glorious manual, we see that it does this by loading in the RIP that we previously saved in the RCX register way back when we first issued out that syscall. Yeah, we're back in user land ready to continue our execution. Now the especially malicious of you may be thinking the following. Okay, so if I just overwrite the addresses of let's say the IA3012 star with the SSDT, then can't I just control the entire universe, make the kernel run my code, or intercept anything I want? How nefarious of you. Yeah, you could, or at least you used to be able to. It was really common for security solutions and malware alike to place hooks on these execution flow directors, but with the advent of Microsoft's kernel patch protection, KPP, or as it's called by the cool kids, patch guard, any attempt now to overwrite or hook these things will result in... Now, patch guard's not perfect, of course, and many cool bypasses and techniques have shown up over the years. Things like ghost hook, infinity hook, by PG, just to name a few, and some of them were even being used by certain security solutions. But for the most part, patch guard does pose a pretty big prickly thorn in the sides of the unmotivated. So there's that. Anyways, back on topic. Let's now cover what direct system calls are and make an injector which utilizes them. Recall how in the last video we removed the Win32 API wrappers that abstracted the NT API. Direct syscalls remove the whole NT API part and just execute the system calls directly. You might be asking, what's the point? I mean, effectively, we're doing the same things, right? There actually is a very important reason why we might do this. Aside from going down a bit deeper and aside from removing another spotlight on us, there's one major practical reason why. And in order to understand what I mean, we must really quickly discuss what hooking is. We'll go into great lengths about API hooking and the different kinds of hooking in another video because it's really interesting stuff and really fun, but let's just paint a picture here with really broad strokes. Say one day you decide you want to ethically hack a company Acme Incorporated. And so you use the last thing you learned from this channel. Now, aside from the earth being on fire and you getting stun locked by Interpol, you realized that holy shit, your malware was not only detected, it was spotted, shredded, massacred, and now it's being given to some nerds who are about to treat your sample like a biology experiment. You couldn't have ever foreseen that Acme Incorporated had employed a brand new security solution. Oh, and it's a big one. The heuristics driven and point assistance for disrupting Motherf the heuristics driven endpoint assistance for disrupting adversarial schemes and strategies, or HEADASS for short, which is an all around EDR, XDR, AV, blah blah blah. Upon running your little NT API injector, this behemoth, this paladin of scrutiny and merciless ferocity, destroyed your, in its word, <clears throat> cute little process. But how? We were under the impression that the further we go, the less heat there is on us. And yes, that's definitely true, but only to an extent. The autopsy, <laughs> digital forensic, uh, the autopsy revealed that this demigod of defense was actually hooking your calls to the NT API. Huh? How? Well, it turns out it has some nasty, dirty little tricks up its sleeve as well. So what it does, as soon as your process starts running, it injects its own DLL into your process. And from that point on, it would hook certain calls to commonly abused Windows API and native API, which you were definitely using and not hiding the fact that you were using. So what had happened happened was, you'd issue out your call to let's say NT open process for example, and where we'd expect a regular system call stub, we instead got this hooked 
tripwire landmine nightmare scenario instead. And as much as I'm fighting myself to not go on an hour long tangent about API hooking and all the insanely cool methods you can use to unhook your hooked functions or libraries, we have to keep this brief. But if you guys want it enough, I'll make a, a video on hooking and unhooking as well. So let's aim for like, I don't know, 25 quadrillion likes. Yeah, something like that. The reason this is done is we have to first of all remember that how much easier it is for headass to intercept and examine what's going on when you don't even bother using syscalls. For example, let's take create thread or virtual alloc or something. Each of these functions in some way or another reference our payload. It's one of their parameters is literally where to start from. And because they have that reference to our payload, like for example, with create thread, we have the LP start address, which is literally where we tell it to start from. And because in classic scenarios, we want our payload to be ran when we create a new thread, the start address of of the thread is just gonna be our payload. Now, the payload could be written down in a buffer through virtual alloc, which will also point to that address where it's all stored. Thinking like the defense here, if we're a security solution like an EDR and we've hooked the Win API or the NT API, we intercept these functions with all of their arguments, meaning that, oh, Hold on, we stopped to create thread from running, or hey, we stopped to virtual alloc or virtual protect for that matter even. Well, let's see what it's trying to do. All right, so over here, remember this is not meant to go in depth just a really high overview. Over here, I have a classic thread hijacking program, create a little process in a suspended state, change the context thread, and then update the instruction pointer to point to our payload. And so if we press enter here, it will run and we should get a shell. All right, so we just allocate some memory to it. We get the thread context. The context just has a bunch of register states for our suspended thread. So we start off the thread in suspended. We get its context. We change out its instruction pointer, and then we set its thread again and resume the thread. And then when it resumes, it's going to be pointing at our payload, which is allocated here. And then press enter. So yeah, you see our payload worked properly. Now, there are many different ways to hook APIs. You can make your own little hooking thing. You can use a library like detours or minhook. If you're a student from Maldev Academy, what you can do is come down to module 64, the syscalls user line hooking thing, and they give us a really cool DLL, which just utilizes some API hooking. And so if we take the DLL, which you can just download here, I've downloaded it quite a few times just to show you. What I've done is sort of just programmed a little bit extra from what they've given out. What they've given you is great. You can use it and it'll help you understand kind of what happens with API hooking. You can work around it if you'd like to or try to. And so what we want to do is when this program runs, we want to actually inject this EDR DLL into our malware. I've just added in some little things like logging utilities for me because I, I like to be very verbose. We open this up in a debugger. I use my favorite one, but you use the one that you want to. And so we have this command prompt open. To actually inject the EDR DLL, you come into here. Once that's done, you want to go into misc and DLL injection. This gives us the ability to inject a DLL into a process of our choice. And so and once we inject it, we should see that it will print out its message. All right, there we go. <laughs> it's slowed down. It injects, it prints out a little message. This is not part, none of this is part of our thread hijacking function. So it starts, it initializes the hooking library. It creates a hook. I added in this hook, but we're not gonna see it here. So I've disabled it. But the anti-protect virtual memory one is enabled. And it's the one that comes shipped with the Maldev EDR that we just downloaded. I've had it so that it detects and based, and this might happen in EDRs. Some processes do utilize these APIs for proper use. So what we want to do is monitor whenever something suspicious happens, like page execute read by itself. Isn't that suspicious? If we had like page read write and then it went into, or if it, we just started with page execute read write, well, the full permissions, that's really suspicious. And most EDRs will just kill your program. But this, and I'll show that. If we press enter now, what's going to happen is the following. Three, two, one. Ah. We got intercepted. Our API was hooked. It hooked it, read its arguments, and when it did, it noticed that, holy shit, this is MSF Venom. This is, this is shellcode. And over here, we can see this is our thread hijacking output because it's not outputted in my beautiful login library. <laughs> bug. So this is where we actually allocate our memory. This isn't. Over here, we see that we start off with the page read write allocation type, right? We allocate our payload to it, but to make it executable, we need to like have executable writes on our buffer in order to run our payload. So what I've done here is just change it to RWX, but you could also change it to RX and it, there should be logic with this EDR or something like that that detects these changes and then we'll act on it. RWX is almost overkill in many things so that this detects it and just kills it. And when it detects it, it dumps the memory, right? It saw that this is suspicious 
she says, hell, this is malware, this is shell code, and then it terminates it and kills it, and we can see. We are left with no choices here. Remember, this is not meant to be something crazier because we can literally make an entire video dedicated on API hooking, like how there's inline hooking, trampolines, the different ways of bypassing or unhooking. There's so much that we could do. So if you want to know more, there are many resources for you to learn, but I will eventually be making a video on this. So just hold on a little bit and we'll get there. I can't believe I almost forgot the most important part. Let's go look at the, the syscall stub and see how it's different. Forgot to mention that and it's actually very, very important. So we've injected our EDR. So uh, it's monitoring, it's inter intercepting suspicious calls. So if we go into symbols here and we go into, into DLL and remember we're, we're intercepting calls to anti-protect virtual memory. Let's look for that. We see that oh, this looks nothing like a syscall stuff that we've been used to. It starts off with a jump instruction. It jumps to something that we control. And you're gonna see me program out a dynamic syscall retrieving function later on in direct syscalls. That's not gonna work in scenarios like this because the offsets are gonna be all wrong. You could start the base address and keep iterating until you find a specific opcode or something like that. But if you just rely on hard set offsets, this is gonna bork the entire thing. That's what that looks like. We can see everything else is just normal. I also had virtual alloc hooked but i just kind of disabled it just so we don't get overloaded uh, we should be able to see anti-allocate virtual memory which is virtual allocs thing and yeah we can see that this is also hooked so i hope that provides some insight let's just trigger this because we have to now beautiful and yeah we just <laughs> stack over well yeah so a little bit buggy but you know, it works. Also in regards to the hooks, remember that defensive solutions don't typically hook all functions since only a relatively small subset of functions are even used for malware. If they did hook all functions, it would be very cumbersome and it would come at the cost of performance. There are many ways we could implement these syscalls. There are dedicated tools that are designed for generating all kinds of functions and headers and all the assembly that you need, but as an obsessive follower and believer in the understand something before you let something else do it for you approach, we'll do everything manually here. And of course, there are many ways to do this. Sh you can even do this all with inline assembly, but unfortunately, MSVC, which is the default compiler that comes with Visual Studio, doesn't have support for 64-bit inline assembly. Yeah, I know, I know, what the f Microsoft? But there are alternatives. A great friend of mine introduced me to the Intel compiler, which does let you do an inline assembly for both 32-bit and 64-bit. But there are other options out there, which you can go ahead and try to find out. For us right now, this will be fine. We'll just program it out in separate source files. Oh, for fuck's sake, I forgot that, you know, we're used to the Windows types and I just wrote this all using standard C types, so, uh, editing magic. Yeah, so we can see from the main file over here, instead of programming out the entire logic of the direct syscalls implementation directly in main, we put it as its own function. It's way more modular this way. Say like we're building an injector with multiple different techniques, like what I've done here. You could just call these specific functions and just have it go like that. Aside from modularity, I don't really understand the use cases for this. It's not like you're going to be machine gunning a bunch of injection methods into the same process. It's not really good for OPSEC, but you know, I mean, honestly, that will be your guys' homework. <laughs> 
for the end of this entire thing. You're gonna take all the techniques that we've learned thus far, combine it into one single file with a bunch of modular ass functions and then just see how many times you can open the calculator. So we start off in our main function just by allocating our actual payload into the dot text section. This is just one of the ways that we can do it. Remember there are different placements and different sections or places we can place our payload or we can stage our payload somewhere and get it from like a web server or the Windows registry. Out of scope here, we actually don't wanna have our payloads in our files. This isn't completely finished by the way. We're gonna program out the assembly part soon. Yeah, so we call out the direct syscalls injection function, which it's a Boolean type, so if it fails, we'll exit out. But if we go into the logic of this function, you're not gonna see anything new here in terms of injection logic. Like everything that we've done up until this point, it's the exact same thing. It's just with the lower and lower level APIs, which require a little bit more setup, but the exact same logic is here. Even for indirect syscalls, which we'll work on right after this, the logic is going to be the same. It's just the way that we incorporate these steps is going to be different. Let me scroll down and I will have the NTAPI implementation and then I'll put it side by side just so you can see the differences between direct syscalls and NTAPI in the logic of it. So here. All right, now the biggest thing you will see is that in the middle chunk of our function, where we would have get proc address, we would have our function prototypes and we'd be casting our newly defined function names to our prototypes, getting that address of that function so that we can use the NT API. We are not doing that here because again, if this was hooked, we would be calling the NT API and that would get triggered. The hooks would get triggered. It would see what we're running. If it detected something malicious, it would kill our program. What we're doing here, it's very, very similar, but all we're doing is we're going to be extracting the system call number from our function here so that we can take this global variable i know ooh, global variables horrible we can take our global variables which are defined in our header file over here and then we can use that in our assembly file which we'll create in a second so that way we never actually call the nt api and even in our function prototypes or whatever we can see that no longer are we type defining a function prototype for us to use explicitly by using a address from get proc address what we're doing instead we're using the external keyword telling the solution get this from somewhere else this is externally defined which in our case it's going to be from our assembly file and in our assembly file we're just going to be recreating the syscall stubs of these functions aside from that everything else is the exact same we can just call it directly actually whereas with the ntapi implementation we'd have to mold a new function based on our function prototype and the address that we got but this you can literally call directly because we're externally providing its functionality from our assembly file and so we just go through this and this should not be new to you because we've covered this in past videos so now we can go into the actual logic of the get syscall number remember there are many different ways that we can dynamically look for syscall numbers i think hell's gate was the first thing i ever read about dynamic Dynamic syscall retrieval. It's a really cool read. Read it here if you can. It doesn't matter if you can or can't, just you have to read it. The reason I haven't hard coded it in, or I'm not going to be hard coding it in into our assembly file that we're going to create, is because syscalls are undocumented. They can and most likely will change from version to version, build to build, and so it's not reliable. This isn't a perfect function <laughs> by any means, okay? It won't work in all scenarios because remember our offsets will be all screwed up like we saw in the API hooking section. Most solutions will place a five by unconditional jump instruction in the beginning of our syscall stub, which we seen but it works so over here we kind of see the logic and we'll come back to this once we're debugging just so that it's super duper clear first we start off by getting the function address so we are calling get proc address here which is not good for iat stuff like your import address table having this function in there our program is going to be under a lot of scrutiny for having this in its import address table so we are using get proc address but it's very easy to program out your very own implementation of get proc address and that kind of helps in a little bit but yeah so we get the address of the function that we're looking for it could be any function, any NTAPI function, which is in side of NTDL, which is why we specify this module handle, because that's how like proc address works. We start from the base address of that function, and then at the offset of four, which is going to be here, what we're going to do is just get the first byte over here in this entire series. And it's going to be much clearer once we start debugging this. You'll actually see this happen in real time and we can show you that these offsets make sense. We return whatever value we get. It's really cool. It's so simple. It's so cool. Oh, and then in case you're wondering what this is, don't worry, you'll get the source code all uploaded to GitHub. You can view all of this in case I, you're like, what the hell is that, Crow? Why aren't you covering every single line? Well, we don't have time, man. We don't have time. You can find it in GitHub though, everything here. We need to program out the assembly file 
because without our assembly, all we have here is just a bunch of ghost code that literally won't do anything and it can't or because we're directly providing the functionality from that assembly file. Well, first and foremost, actually, if you've watched the self-deleting malware video, we've already set up Mazen before or the Microsoft macro assembler, which is what we're going to need to compile our assembly file, but it's very quick and easy to set up. So I'll just go over it again. Right click on our project settings, build dependencies, build customizations, and make sure this is selected. If it's not, we won't be able to select this type for our assembly file in our source files. Just control shift A, just call it something, I don't know. And in here, our entire objective here in our assembly file is to one, recreate the assembly syscall stubs for every single function we use, and two, use the dynamically harvested syscall numbers from this function, which I have included as global variables. And in our assembly file, what that would look like is the following. In data, we initialize these variables, and in code is the actual like logic and code where we program this out. You can see that for every single function that we use, we just set up, <laughs> we just set it up directly, so it no longer has to go into NTDLL and do this. The only time we go into NTDLL is just to retrieve the addresses of these functions, which we use only to get the syscall numbers. Whereas with NTAPI, we get the address of the function and then we start executing from that address, basically just executing the function. And so we transitively do syscalls, but we don't directly do them. With this though, we are directly invoking these syscalls, right? So we move in the values that we get. Remember, there are different ways to do this. You can do it at compile time or runtime or whatever, blah, blah, blah. It's the same thing over and over. And But with that done, oh, and actually what we have to do first is make sure this is included. If this item type is not set to Microsoft Macro Assembler, we have to set it. And I just like to explicitly say that, hey, this is not excluded from the build. And if you don't enable the build dependencies from Masm here, this is not even gonna show up. So that's why you have to include that. Now we're ready to test. Let's just build a solution. Okay, and compiles without errors for once. Holy shit. Let's see what this can do against our unassuming notepad process. All right, so here's our notepad. Now, if we run this, we should see a calculator spawning. Three, two, one. Let's go, boy. <laughs> cool. Nice. Yeah, look, this is all direct syscalls, and we can actually prove this by debugging it, and we actually should debug it just so we understand the logic of that harvesting function, as well as actually proving that, hey, this is directly invoking syscalls. So first what I'll do is just this. Okay, I'll just pick any one. I don't know why I have two open. And what I'm going to do is come into debug. The properties, debugging, and set the command line arguments to our pit of our notepad, and then we're going to start debugging this. So start debugging. Oh, shit. I forgot to set a breakpoint. It's okay. It's okay. I'll set a breakpoint a couple of different locations in the program just so we get the best idea of what's actually happening. I'll do one at this function just so we can see the logic that's happening here. And then I'll do another one here where we actually make our first call to a function. And then in the assembly file, I'll put one right here. So if we start debugging, we hit our first breakpoint because we want the address and this is called number for NT open process first. The address here is going to be the address of NT open process. And coming down into our memory view, we have the address of NT open process right here. And so we see that it starts off at the base and we know that this is the start of the function because these bytes are present and they're present for a bunch of different other functions right here. These are all NT open functions. All right. So these bytes represent the move RCX into R10 instruction. Right after that, we have our movie ax instruction right but at offset three so if we so 93 right so it starts at 90 when we go up three the offset of three we get to this line b8 26 and then three zeros this is this line right here where we move the syscall number into eax and at the fourth offset which is what we're looking at right here is this because we're at three right here one more and we have this value along with the three zeros so what we do here is just get the first Byte, which is just 26. And if we see here, the syscall number that gets returned, if we step forward in instruction, it's 26. It's very cool. All right. And then we can continue. Let's continue until we get to the next breakpoint, which is going to be when we actually issue out that call to NT open process within our direct syscalls function. So function can continue. Oh, it's going to continue until all of them. So let's just say so yeah, all of these syscall values are populated. We have the addresses of all these functions. So now when we issue our first call, what we're going to see is that it's going to go into our syscall stub, which is really good because that means it's actually going to be running from here, what we've defined. So if we continue, let's go here and step into, look, we see that we landed in our assembly file and we can keep on continuing. And look, we're at the syscall instruction. We had another breakpoint. If we continue now, a syscall will have been invoked. Let's just run that. Step in into open process. There we go. A syscall was invoked and we return out. <laughs> there we go. NT open process has been executed. Now we continue. And if we just skip over this, there we go. I hope that provided some insight into what's been happening here. And now we can look into what happens with indirect syscalls, which is also really cool. Now, one of the biggest issues with direct syscalls is actually, it's better if I just show you. Allow me 
to paint you a picture. Pretend for a second you're a defensive solution once again, and suddenly a new process spawns. It looks normal enough with nary a suspicious string nor calls to those pesky little Win32 APIs or native APIs that you've come to know for what feels like eons now. It looks so clean that you'd be tempted to eat off of it. You let out a struggled sigh as you can feel the tenseness escape from your skeptically arched eyebrows. The stakes are so measurably high, you can't let another incident happen again. Not. Not after last time. Then, as a lump in your throat grows larger, emitting from the program a sound you've never heard before, you slowly inch closer. So dreadfully slow. Upon examining the program, you can see that the program is invoking system calls and sh** inside of it directly. Why the f*** are you doing that? Hey, why the f*** are you doing that? You say as a deafening sound suddenly engulfs the room, terrorizing your ears, ringing. Mm -hmm says the program, going back to making those jarring noises, which as you've understood by now, was a signature, unmistakable, jarring sound of a syscall being made. I don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> lol. You bring onto it a hammer of retribution and ferocious damnation with such surging power that you make the gods of Olympus look like little big planet characters. Each strike you proclaim perjury and the process dies. So yeah, the biggest issue with direct syscalls is that there's rarely ever a f***ing case in which a program needs to be invoking a syscall within itself, where it's warranted or needed. That makes your program look so suspicious, much more suspicious. I mean, sure, you can argue for the few cases within which it's actually needed to be done or it has to be done, but the genuine use cases are pretty few and far in between. It's, it's very niche. Indirect syscalls attempt to remedy this issue by doing the exact same thing as direct syscalls, except instead of invoking the syscall instruction directly, we perform an unconditional jump to it, unconditional meaning that when it's time to jump, it will jump no matter what, inside of NTDLL. You see, if we do it like this, look at what happens. That process that you mercilessly obliterated previously will never be making that syscall sound because it will never be directly invoking a syscall within itself. Do you see the benefits of doing it this way? Now, that's not to say that indirect syscalls are the end-all be-all. That's definitely not the case, but this technique is pretty damn good. And I must admit, it's got a really special place in my heart. So enough talking, let's program this out. If you look at the indirect syscalls example right here, it's literally the exact same code, except the main difference is we define some new global variables. I know guys, I know. This is gonna be for the syscall instruction. This is gonna be the address of the syscall instruction. It does the same function as a get syscall number, except we're not just getting the syscall number, we're gonna be exporting out the syscall number, yes, but we're also gonna be exporting out the syscall's address as well. And so this is the logic of what's happening here. At the offset of four, that's what we reach to get our syscall number. Right, so and then we get the syscall number, we export it out to the global system call, right? We export it out here. And next up, at the offset of 12 is where we find a syscall instruction. What we do when we get to the offset of 12 is we look for the syscall instruction, which is opcodes 0f05. And we do a compare to see if whatever value we land at is equal to this opcode value or not. And if it's equal, we've just found a valid syscall instruction. And the thing is, with syscall, in our indirect syscalls, we don't need to do this. You literally could just have one of these. Because at the end of the day, it's just a syscall instruction. It doesn't really matter if it's for your specific function or if it's just one that you use for all of them. Because what we're issuing is a syscall. It's not important like how a syscall number is because syscall numbers are particular to the specific function that you're calling, whereas a syscall instruction is just a syscall instruction, so you can just use one if you want to. And I'll prove this. We can see that it's the exact same logic. There's nothing different aside from how we set up our parameters or our arguments or whatever. And in our assembly file, over here where it used to be a syscall, is now an unconditional jump to the address of a syscall that we scrape. Right? So yeah, we are running syscalls, but indirectly because we're jumping to it rather than directly invoking it. And when we do it like this, actually if we remove all of these and just have all the syscall instructions be a unconditional jump to the syscall address we scrape for anti-open process syscall, then you'll see that it'll still work. There we go. Look, that is our first calculator open with indirect syscalls. Oh my god. Over here we see that we get the address of the function, right? We get the address of where the syscall is located. Remember, it's at an offset of 12, so this offset by 12 is going to be A2. This offset by 12 is going to be E2, 22, blah, 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 right? Or what you could do is just take this final address, subtract it by this, and you'll see. Actually, we have a calculator open right here. Might as well just do it. Where is our programmer calculator? Look, we have A2 minus 90 offset of 12. And there we go. And uh, if we set a breakpoint here, Look, we reached this breakpoint. Oh god, I hate 
debugging here, right? And if we step into it, look, it doesn't issue without a syscall like it did in direct syscall. So it's jumping to something that we don't have the source for. But if we view the disassembly, we've jumped into NT, this is NTDLL, right? We've jumped into NTDLL and we've gotten the address of the syscall instruction, which we also printed out here. Look at that. It's the same address. And that's where we've jumped to. And if we continue this along, it's going to be really cool, which you'll see. Like, let's go over here to NT create thread, for example. If this was direct syscalls, this would be in NT create thread, but we're jumping to the address of NT open processes syscall. And so if we step into this, view this disassembly, we're in anti open processes stub right now. We got direct syscalls working, indirect syscalls working. This is a great day today. And we figured out the logic. So it should be making a little bit of sense as to what we're doing here in terms of logic. Direct syscalls, we're just extracting the syscall number. With indirect syscalls, we want to get the address of the syscall instruction as well so we can indirectly invoke a syscall. And we saw through the debugging steps that that's what was happening. And now what you can do, because we have these three modular ass functions, we can just include it in one file if you wanted to. That's going to be your homework. <laughs> Just so now if we run this, you'll see it's gonna look so stupid. We're gonna get a machine gun blast of calculators spawning. This is this is not practical, but it is just good to exercise your modularity programming skills and stuff like that. You know, just programming. Three, two, one. It's so stupid. It is so dumb. It does look sick though. I will give this degenerate ass program that. But yeah, look if we just. It is a boom boom boom. <laughs> it's so stupid. Over here we have our NT API function over here we have our direct syscalls function and over here we have indirect syscalls and yeah we get three calculators because of it so yeah it's very cool that's gonna be your homework set something like this up obviously don't use it there's no point but yeah it's cool thank you so much for watching this video i like to extend another thank you a huge thank you to maldiv academy for sponsoring this video for continuing to be great friends of the channel i hope you really enjoyed this video i hope you learned a thing or two and see you in the next video and as always goodbye